As a marine biologist, and specifically as a marine conservation biologist, my days are spent trying to protect species and prevent extinction. I've been interested in studying sharks as long as my family can remember. I feel like most kids go through a shark thing or a dinosaur thing at some point in their childhood. And I actually went through both of those. And despite living in a, a pretty small city far from the ocean, Pittsburgh, we had access to an amazing aquarium and an amazing dinosaur museum. So I got to feed both of those obsessions. I'm one of the lucky few who's sort of always known what they want to do. The difference between marine biology and marine conservation biology is sort of how applied the scientific research is. It's the difference between what does this fish eat versus this fish is in trouble and one of the threats to this fish is that its food source is running out. What can we do about that? Or where does this sea turtle go versus this sea turtle is threatened? How does its migration pattern overlap with known threats for the species? It's often the same methods. It's a lot of the same people. It's a lot of the same study systems. The, the difference between marine biology and conservation biology has to do a lot with what you're using the data for. Every day is a little bit different with my sort of interdisciplinary conservation biology career. I live and work in the Washington, D.C. area as sort of the nexus of science and environmental advocacy and policy making. But I do get to spend a few days a year out on a research vessel in South Florida, participating in a variety of ongoing research projects and get to see live sharks in the wild, which is always a treat. But there aren't a lot of people who are technically trained in science who also speak policy, who also speak environmental advocacy. So a lot of what I do is trying to make these different groups understand each other and understand each other's role and understand what we need from each other to work together in service of saving these animals. The best shark, follow hashtag best shark on Twitter and Instagram to learn all about them, is the sandbar shark. They are a really widely studied species, which means that they've contributed a lot to our understanding of the ocean. They're a very common species found in captivity, which means that for millions of kids around the world, the first shark they ever see in their whole life is a sandbar shark at an aquarium. There have never been any sandbar sharks at the Pittsburgh Zoo's aquarium where, where I grew up visiting, but for millions of other kids, a sandbar shark is the first shark they ever see, and we know that that can inspire a lifelong love of the ocean and a lifelong desire to protect and understand sharks, because it sure did for me and many of my colleagues. There are a lot of species of sharks found in the southeastern coast and the Gulf Coast of the United States. Tiger sharks, you get great white sharks sometimes, bull sharks, plenty of sandbar sharks in the region, hammerhead sharks, and there's also plenty that you haven't heard of. Predators help keep the food web in balance. And when we're talking about the ocean and our coasts, that is a series of ecosystems that give billions of humans food and jobs. So they're critical for helping to ensure livelihoods and uh, global food security. When you lose predators, the whole food web can start to unravel in a lot of scary and unpredictable ways that can be devastating, especially for humans that depend on these ecosystems, as well as a variety of wildlife. Sharks get a really bad rap in the popular press. An analysis by colleagues of mine about 10 years ago found that less than 10% of news stories about sharks even mention that they're ecologically important animals and are some of the most threatened with extinction animals in the world. Most stories are about sharks biting people. And an absolutely flabbergasting statistic about this is that an analysis some other colleagues of mine did of how shark attacks, sarcastic air quotes, are portrayed in the media found that in a third of reported shark attacks in Australia, the shark didn't physically touch the human at all. It swam near them in a way that the person thought was threatening and aggressive. And whenever that happens, it's headline news all over the world. So it leads to this false impression that if you dip your toe in your bathtub, a shark is going to eat your whole family. And it's just not true. More people are killed in toaster accidents every year. More people are killed by flower pots falling on their head from above when they walk down the street than are killed by sharks. More people are bitten by other people on the New York City subway system every year than are bitten by sharks in the whole world. So it's just not something you need to worry about. If you've been in the ocean, there was probably a shark not that far from you, and it knew you were there even if you didn't see it, and it left you totally alone and you had a lovely day at the beach. That is a typical experience that millions of people have every day. 
there's this whole genre of news stories and this alarmist media coverage that just drives me crazy, which is drone footage from above that, oh my God, look at this drone footage of a shark swimming near people at the beach. The people didn't know that the shark was there. It was totally leaving them alone. It's just near them. And near the beach is another way of saying in the water where fish are supposed to live. If you see a shark walking down Main Street, give me a call, but otherwise not especially impressed by shark near the beach. I wrote this book last year, Why Sharks Matter, and I have been traveling all over the world talking about it. I find that people have questions. People are interested in sharks. They have some misconceptions about sharks. They have some things that they'd like to know more about, and I see it as part of my job to talk to the public.